10, 9, ignition sequence start, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine running. Welcome to part four of our video series highlighting the assembly of the new 1100 scale Saturn V kit from Estes. In this installment, we'll be assembling and finishing the simulated F1 rocket motor nozzles. Now these are used only for static display, not flight. You'll remove the rocket nozzle assembly before prepping your completed model for flight, then replace it when you put the model back on the shelf for display. For this step, we will need the base for the nozzle assembly, the nozzle parts themselves, and when that's complete, we'll add this tube section, which acts as a spacer between the aft centering ring and the nozzle base. We'll start by removing the cardstock nozzle base from the backing sheet, and then clearing all of these tiny little holes into which the nozzles will be mounted. I'm using a number 11 blade here. We'll need to separate the nozzle parts from the sprues that they've been shipped on. And to do that, we can use a standard number 11 X-Acto blade. It's very easy to do. Now what we want to do here, we need to be mindful of the fact that we can damage the side of the part as we cut it off. So, be very gentle. Now we can also use a purpose-built tool for that. These are side nippers that can be used for the same thing. What's unique about these is they have a flat side that goes up against the part and leaves a very clean cut. Be easier to get this one from the side. These also work. These are purpose-built side cutters designed for models. I believe these are made by a company called Zuron, or they are a knockoff of the Zuron product. They work much the same. They do give you a little more leverage, though, and leave a very clean cut. Here's another type made by a company called, and I am not making this up, Turbo Dork. These are surgically sharp, and I really like them. We now have 10 nozzle halves and 10 retaining rings. We're done with the retaining rings for now. The next thing we need to do is clear up this little sprue nub at the bottom of each nozzle half. To do that, we can use sanding sticks or an emery board. This one came from North Coast Rocketry. Just give it a few passes with the emery board. Your fingers will be able to tell you when you're done quicker than your eyes will. Now these are Specialized products sold in hobby stores. They work just as well. They come in a variety of grits. And we're done. Time for assembly. We've zoomed in a bit and we're now ready to assemble our nozzle halves. I'll do a dry run first so we understand exactly what the plan is. We're going to apply a bit of cement, and we'll be using Tamiya Extra Thin Cement, to the inside surfaces of the top portion of the nozzle half. We'll then put them together, align them carefully, and then we're going to put a binder clip on there to hold all of that together. We'll then use a paintbrush. This is an old paintbrush I've had for years. I use only for applying glue. And we'll apply additional glue up that joint on both sides. Bring everything together and carefully align everything until it's just about perfect. We'll do this for real this time. 
The cement is painted onto the top surfaces of the nozzle halves. Then we bring the two halves together. Our binder clamp then goes on top. Next, we use the paintbrush to apply cement to the seams on each side. Capillary action will do most of the heavy lifting here. The two halves are then adjusted and readjusted and then adjusted again. Then some more cement is applied to the interior seams. I'll hold this for a minute longer until the glue sets up. The cement on our nozzle parts has cured, so our next task will be to clean up these seams just a little bit. Now these are very well molded parts and we took the time to align them properly, but there's still just a little bit of a, a catch there. It's real simple to fix. I've got a number of sanding sticks here and I'm just lightly going to polish areas of the seam on both sides of the part. For some of the crevices we can use a cut down sanding stick. And then polish everything with an extra fine sanding stick. We'll do that four more times. With the sanding complete we can now go over the parts with a tack cloth. Now a tack cloth is just some cheap cheese cloth that's been impregnated with a mild adhesive, probably wax based, and it will get rid of any stray sanding dust. You can get these at Home Depot or Lowe's or any hardware store in the paint section very inexpensively. As I was assembling and sanding the nozzle parts, something popped out that just kind of bugged me. Let's look up the nozzle throat here. I'll rotate it so you can see it a little better. There are four elevated bits here. And those are spots on the part that are engineered in there for the ejector pins. When, when a part is molded, after the molding takes place, there are often metal pins that pop the part out of the mold. It helps increase the cycle time or the speed with which the parts can be molded. Sometimes they appear in unfortunate places. Fortunately, we can get rid of those very quickly. Let me show you how I plan to do that. First, I measured that throat. And down there is just a hair over one inch. I've taken a piece of scrap styrene plastic. This is 010 thick styrene plastic and I have this circle gauge for drafting. There's a one inch circle on there. I'm going to place that onto the styrene and with a pen, mark that circle. I'll then take a sharp X-Acto. We don't need to cut all of the way through this. We just want to score the plastic. Now we can flex the plastic and that part will pop right out. I'm not wearing my magnification so my edges are a little ratty. I'll clean that up a bit. Next I can take a sanding stick and clean that up just a little bit. And amazingly, that pops in there perfectly. Since that test fit went so well, I'll dab some liquid cement on those four ejector pin points and set the part back in there. Apply a little bit of pressure and we've covered up the sins of the nozzle. As we prime our nozzles, we'll be using these clips. These are alligator clips attached to a short length of cable. And these are sold in craft stores or online as photo clips. You clip photographs onto them and stick them in, I don't know, flower arrangements or whatever. They're great for this purpose. You just clip it onto the tab at the top of the nozzle. We'll also be priming the base plate for the nozzle assembly. To help us out there, We'll use a tape tag to attach it to a piece of scrap cardboard. 
We're in the paint booth to shoot two layers of the Tamiya primer onto the nozzle base with about seven minutes between coats. Next, we spray a couple of coats of AS20 Insignia White Lacquer, which is essentially a very light gray. Next, the nozzles are primed with Tamiya primer, making sure to hit the inside of the nozzles. The primer doesn't need to be applied heavily to the point of being opaque. Just a couple of light coats are adequate. Let's discuss the real F1 rocket engines before we start painting. All of the F1 engines were tested before flight, so that means they were all, in one sense, used. None of them were showroom fresh. Adding a bit of wear, weathering, and other signs of previous use is entirely appropriate. On the other hand, the engines were also covered in a fabric batting layer called the thermal protection system before actual flight use. That means that they looked completely different than the parts included in this kit. Here's the catch. There aren't a great number of still photos of the covered engines, and they don't look that different in all of the archival launch films. So we're going to conveniently ignore that and aim for the look of an uncovered rocket engine. To that end, we're going to layer the lacquer on in multiple shades. We'll start by doing the aft portions of each nozzle in this dark gunmetal color. We'll then do the middle portions in this lighter gloss aluminum. And then finally, we'll do the top end of the motor in this semi-gloss bright gunmetal. As the darker color goes on the aft nozzle, we make sure to get coverage inside the nozzle, covering the scratch-built cover. The light shade then goes on the middle, and our mid-tone is applied to the upper area. Notice that we've done no masking here. All of this is done freehand. The lacquer on our nozzles has cured and they look fantastic. I couldn't be more pleased with this. The variation in colors is exactly what I want. Even the variation between the individual nozzles makes everything look a little bit more real. However, everything is still just a little bit too clean, so we've got a trick to fix that. We're going to use a technique called dry brushing. I've taken one of our flux brushes and I've cut the bristles off so that they're much shorter and stiffer. I have a bottle of Floquil Bright Silver Enamel, any enamel paint will do, and we're going to put some of this on the brush, wipe most of the paint off onto a paper towel, and then just kind of lightly scrub that against the raised locations on our part. Here, I'll show you. Just pick up a little bit of the silver on the tips of the brush. Wipe most of it off on the paper towel. Just kind of lightly scratch it against the part. The paint will catch on the high portions. We're just doing the lower part of the engine bell here. Let's get a little more paint. We'll repeat that process with some black enamel now. We just want to catch the edges. Too little is better than too much. You can always go back and add more. I like the effect with the black a lot. I think I'm going to take it farther down the nozzle. That looks great. Just for grins, we're going to do a few random stabs 
with some rust. I'm going to turn the brush sideways. I want just barely any on that. You just want to provide some variation. We're creating the illusion of use. The dry brushing on our simulated F1 nozzles has settled down and I could not be more pleased with how these turned out. The variation in tone combined with the, the general filth and used look looks exactly like what I was going for. Is this entirely accurate? No, it's not accurate at all. But it is realistic in when you're building a scale model, there is a bit of a difference between realism and accuracy. We're going to attach the nozzles to the base plate with these retaining rings and some Tamiya extra thin cement. Now the appropriate positioning is for the nozzle side to go out. On the center, the nozzle goes in the very center. I'll use this to help flip everything over. There's a bit of a warp to this base plate, so I'm just providing some downward pressure as we apply the cement. We're going to glue our spacer ring on with five minute epoxy. Before we do that, we're going to do a practice test fit here. This is going to fit against the base plate just inside of the retaining rings that we just glued in place. Also, before we glue that in place, we're going to encapsulate each of these in a little bit of epoxy themselves. I'm using a Q-tip to mix the epoxy. And the reason I'm doing that is because we're going to use the Q-tip as a tool to work some epoxy around each one of these. Next, I'm going to roll the edge of our spacer ring through the pool of our epoxy. I'm going to put plenty on there. I'm not being stingy at all. Next, we put this on top, fitting it in place inside the retaining rings. And then I'm going to put pressure on here for about five minutes until that all sets up. And with that, our nozzle assembly is complete. This will look great when our model is on static display. This assembly will simply slide up into the aft end of the completed booster assembly. Our next video will be the big one, the installation of the corrugated vacuform wraps on the airframe components we've already prepared. Thanks for watching.